Good afternoon, everyone, or whatever time it is in your time zone. My name is Karen Mock, President of JSpace Canada, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to what promises to be a very lively and interesting session of Raja Khoury Conversations in partnership with JSpace Canada. We're delighted to welcome Peter Beinart back to the podium or at least into his living room, to exchange with a dynamic panel of discussants so that he can explain, or dare I say also defend, his recent controversial essay that abandons the quest for a two-state solution to the ongoing conflict in Israel-Palestine. Most of our constituents in Canada were excited about welcoming you back, Peter, but we were balled out by at least one supporter who referred to you as the enemy who shouldn't be given a platform. Well, no, that's not our style. As it says in our pamphlet, and I'm going to quote, JSpace Canada is an all volunteer, nonpartisan, progressive Jewish organization. We support a two state solution, two states for two people, in keeping with Canada's policy as well. And we urge the Canadian government to encourage and support the peace process. We support a negotiated settlement to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that is guided by principles of mutual recognition and respect and reflects the legitimate rights of both peoples to self-determination, peaceful coexistence, and security. And one thing that JSpace Canada and Curie Conversations have in common is our commitment to provide a safe space for what we call the courageous conversations. We strongly believe in the importance of real dialogue to achieve understanding of the other, not coded language, not holding back and not saying how we feel, but also not vitriolic debate where people put each other down. It's the reason that we do these conversations bringing people from both communities together. People who are committed to exploring many ideas to achieve a peaceful resolution to the conflict, one that is built on values of shared society, nonviolence, and of human and civil rights for both peoples, for all peoples, equally. I'll be returning later in the program to give the vote of thanks. But now I am very pleased to turn the session over to my co-host, good friend and colleague, Raja Khoury. Raja is the founder and CEO of Khoury Conversations and was the founding president of the Canadian Arab Institute. He served for 10 years as a commissioner with the Ontario Human Rights Commission and is on the Canada Committee of Human Rights Watch. Raja served with me on the Hate Crimes Community Working Group, and he was my partner and co-founder 13 years ago of the Canadian Arab Jewish Leadership Dialogue Group. And we've been in deep dialogue ever since, even over Zoom. <laughs> Take it away, Raja. Thank you very much, Karen, and welcome everyone to uh, this episode of Kuri Conversations once again in partnership with uh, JSpace Canada. Um, the, at Curie Conversations, for those of you new to us, uh, we, we, we stay away from difficult subjects, as you know, <laughs> and we only deal with issues superficially, <laughs> which, is, which is why uh, we, uh, we chose the conversation format to develop a deeper understanding of issues rather than debate them and declare a winner. Deeper understanding, of course, is what leads to finding common ground and building bridges between communities. 
Now, that said, uh, today we are very proud and delighted to have Peter Barnard with us and a wonderful group of discussants uh, to, to talk about uh, the, you know, the, the infamous, or I should say, the, the very famous essay, Yavne, a Jewish case for equality in Israel, Palestine, that uh, Peter penned uh, 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 last time. Now, the, uh, the format of today is that we're going to be spending most of the time, about 50 minutes, in having a conversation with all the participants. We will be taking questions and I will be fielding them to, the, to our panelists, uh, to our panel and discussants and Peter, and we'll have a conversation with you. Now, uh, as I said, that uh, essay is the reason why we are here today. It's been called the Barnard Earthquake. The American Defense League has called it anti-Semitic. Alan Dershowitz has smeared him as another Nazi with a final solution. Congress members have wondered what it means for the two-state solution. He's been called enfant terrible of US jury. Peter, I hope you've developed very thick skin by now. And uh, of course, you know, the typical Palestinian reaction has been, we've been saying this for years, the two state is dead, it's time for us to talk about equality in one state. So who is Peter Beinart? Peter Barnard is professor of journalism and political science at the City University of New York. He's also a contributor to The Atlantic, a CNN political commentator, editor at large of Jewish Currents, and a non resident fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. He has authored three books, the last one being The Crisis of Zionism in 2012. Barnard has written for leading publications such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Boston Globe, The Atlantic, Newsweek, Slate, etc. The Week magazine named sorry, The Week magazine named him Colonist of the Year for 2004, and in 2005 he gave the Theodore H. White lecture at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He has appeared on This Week with George Stephanopoulos, Charlie Rose, Meet the Press. The Colbert Report, and many other television programs. Barnard graduated from Yale University, winning a Rhodes Scholarship for graduate study at Oxford University. Welcome, Peter. I'll be introducing next our discussants, and after that, we will uh, engage in, in, the, in the conversation. I was going to do this alphabetically, starting with Dana Dejani, who comes to us from London, England. She's an award-winning Palestinian writer, performer, and activist. Her work as an actress, trainer, and consultant has taken her around the world, from performing at the Sydney Opera House to creating a drama therapy program for children with autism in the UAE. In 2016, Dana was honored as Emirates Woman Artist of the Year and received the Young Arab Award for Entertainment, uh, sorry, for entertainment. As a poet, Dana uses her theatrical background to give her spoken word a performative edge. Next, we have Jordan Devon. He's the vice chair of JSpace Canada. He is a public affairs consultant at Crestview Strategy and has staffed political campaigns at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels. Jordan studied at McGill University during which time he served as a CJ PAC fellow and a research intern for the World Jewish Congress in Geneva, Switzerland. Jordan chairs JSpace Canada's Next Generation Committee and served as co-chair for its last conference in 2019. Next we have uh, Bob Katz, uh, is a professional social worker in private practice and a longtime social activist. He is on the National Board of Canadians for Peace Now and he's a chair of the Toronto chapter. He is also on the JSpace Advisory Board Prior to this, he spent 50 years on the board of directors of the Urban Alliance on Race Relations, including three as vice president and three as president, and 12 years previously on the board of directors of the Social Planning Council of Metro Toronto. And last but, last, last but not least, Jarir Khoury, we share the same name, but there's no relation. 
lots of curries, you can shake a stick at them. Has been uh, for 20 fe 25 years in public and private experience. He served six cabinet ministers at the interior government, including director of policy for international trade, environment, and senior advisor to finance, treasury board, and attorney general. He is a business development and public policy professional focused on government, economic strategy, international trade, and political risk. Welcome all. Peter, please start us off with a synopsis of your essay and why it's been called the Barnard Earthquake. Um, so thank you very much for having me. I, I, it's really, um, I have to say, quite inspiring to see um, the way in which, um, you know, the, the, a kind of Jewish-Palestinian um, kind of conversation has been started in, in Canada under your auspices and, and Karen's and others. I actually can't quite think of any equivalent in the United States. So as in many ways, we have a lot to learn from you in the North. Um, I, um, I have been a supporter of uh, partition uh, my entire adulthood. I, I, I'm actually starting to use the word partition rather than two-state solution, because I think that it was, I don't think that creating a Palestinian state alongside a Jewish state, at least as that is generally envisioned in the American Jewish community, the Jewish community in general, would, would be a solution. Um, I think it would leave many important questions unaddressed. Um, it would leave unaddressed the question of is the 20% of Israel's population that are Palestinian citizens who will not feel like they can be equal citizens in a Jewish state. And it generally leaves the refugee question unaddressed, at least as partition is imagined most of the time in the Jewish conversation. But I think one could argue that it would have been a step in the right direction towards a deeper and more fundamental resolution of these questions. But I have, after arguing for this uh, for many years, had been gradually feeling like the arguments that I was making to try to convince others were becoming less convincing to myself. Um, that um, at, a, at a certain point, one, I had to ask the question, when was I going to be willing to acknowledge that the possibilities of creating a, a genuinely viable and sovereign Palestinian state, not just some archipelago of disconnected towns and villages that you call a state, but something that actually can meet basic Palestinian needs in terms of freedom and safety and dignity, that that possibility was becoming ever more remote. And you know, I was struck doing the research for this article that really as early as the 19, early 1980s, you can see people like Bethlehem Mayor Elias Fredge and um, the former mayor, deputy mayor of Jerusalem, Marin van Beniste, saying that 100,000 settlers in East Jerusalem and the West Bank would make a, a viable Palestinian state in the West Bank and East Jerusalem impossible. Now we have about 650,000. And even that number, I think, doesn't really give one a sense of the magnitude of the infrastructure that Israel has built in the West Bank. You know, Israel's most recent medical school last year inaugurated in the West Bank. Nothing about this, when one looks at it, looks like a temporary project. And so I began to feel that I was at a bit of a dead end because I, it's one thing to go out and say things that turn out to be wrong. I've done that a lot. Um, it's another thing to go out as a, as a writer and as a speaker and say things that you yourself no longer really believe. That is really kind of death if you're someone who writes for a living. So I felt at a dead end, frankly. And um, I decided the only way to respond was really to take a fair amount of time and read on a whole series of subjects, um, including um, you know, the way other conflicts, um, South Africa, Northern Ireland, reading about binational states in Bosnia, in Belgium, looking for other kinds of models. And um, I was very uh, influenced by a lot of Palestinian writing on this subject. It's not only Palestinians who have talked about this idea, um, but I think the most the, the most significant contributions to envisioning um, one equal space have been from Palestinians. Uh, Edward Said, starting in the late 1990s, Ali Abu Nima, more recently, Youssef Munayar, even more recently. And I was influenced by those writings. And what I wanted to try to do was write something that would take some of those ideas, but really try to speak to a Jewish audience, to respond to the anxieties and fears that are so current in the Jewish conversation, and all to try to, also to try to put this within our historical narrative, in our story, and to say that we don't need to see it as a betrayal. Karen, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, the Haaretz in an editorial said, Barnard's essay, rather than participating, sorry, precipitating some better future in Israel and Palestine, epitomizes the genre of Western intellectual parlor games that, despite promising paradigm shifts, have no tangible bearing on actual policy. Progress in Israel and Palestine hinges on changing the minds of those in power. Um, what role do you see for um, your thoughts, your thinking uh, on this towards changing the minds of those in power? And what role do we have in the diaspora uh, in, in, that, uh, in that same endeavor? I don't think it's particularly likely that, uh, that, any, that any of us, and certainly not me, are likely to ch change the minds of those in power in Israel. Um, the reality is that the status quo for most Israeli Jews seems like it's working out reasonably well now. Um, uh, Israel controls all of the territory with all the resources that comes with it at fairly low cost. You know, the Palestinian Authority is kind of doing, is serving as Israel's subcontractor in the West Bank. Even in a certain way, Hamas is serving as Israel's subcontractor by keeping things quiet in Gaza. And, and look, if you look at other historical conflicts, when one group of people has privilege and basic rights, they're very rarely likely to change that unless they are forced to come to the conclusion that the status quo is no longer possible. Um, and Israeli leaders have not been forced to come to that, uh, to come to that conclusion. So to me, I think that the right question is less, um, how do we change the mind of Benjamin Netanyahu or people like that? It's how can we contribute to a movement that will ultimately create a kind of pressure that forces uh, Israeli Jews in, in, uh, to reckon with the fact that they're controlling millions of people who lack basic rights. Now, I very much hope that, that that pressure, which forces a reconsideration, can be uh, nonviolent and that it can even be in a certain way, again, in the spirit of Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi or others, expressed in, in a language of, of love and, 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 and of, of, of humanity. Um, but ultimately, it's only when I think a movement arises, and it will obviously be primarily a Palestinian led movement since Palestinians are the, one who are, who are the ones who are being denied basic rights. But I think that Jews, uh, we have a very important role to play in this as well. And um, one of the reasons that I ultimately shifted towards the idea of equality within one uh, political entity is that I believe that a vision of equality is more likely to produce that mass movement than a vision of separation. What about the diaspora, Peter? Like, uh, do you think a Jewish Palestinian movement here in Canada or in the United States can come together to influence our own governments here on, on their Israel-Palestine policy? Yes, I, I think that we can lay, create the, the, the foundations, the building blocks. We may never, never, there may be differences. People may not agree on everything. Um, but I think that we can, I think that what you are doing, what Karen is doing and others is building those bridges um, around shared principles is, is, is critical. Not that, that pressure from, from outside, I think, is, necessary, is likely to be decisive. But I think that one day, and again, there are probably people on this call who, who might be able to foresee it better than me, it seems to me one day things will shift on the ground. That it is not likely that Palestinians on the ground in the West Bank and Gaza, or even in refugee camps, are simply forever going to sit back and accept their denial of basic rights. We already saw with the March of Return, there will be new movements that force a new conversation. And I think what we have to do is prepare for that day. So when that happens and it forces a shift in conversation, both in Israel and in governments like the US and Canada, that we are prepared to enter that conversation to take up, to, to kind of avail ourselves of that opportunity. I think, you know, if you look at what happened in South Africa in the 1980s, it was the combination of international pressure and the fact that the ANC and their local allies essentially, starting in the 1980s, made the townships ungovernable and started to show that the, the, the leadership of South Africa, that the status quo could not continue. When you first mentioned uh, creating a movement, I saw Dana uh, nod uh, 
very ag agreeably. So maybe, Dana, I'll call you to uh, start us off with the, uh, you know, with, with, with your reaction to, uh, to Peter's uh, essay or thoughts. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to, to be part of this conversation. I'm grateful to be in shared space. I think that we need common ground and coming into this with um, a background in a theatrical style of storytelling. I think it's really important, uh, sorry, as I said earlier in conversation with you, to have conversations, not just that's, you know, are of the intellect and from the intellect, but that are um, feeling states and dreaming states that speak to the heart, that speak to the imagination, that I feel like we need a spiritual fantasy. And I think that's what you called for in Yavne, Peter. And this is what propels us to uh, think beyond our limitations and act uh, to align ourselves with a vision and, and to have a rubric through which we can compare ourselves. How, fall do we sh how short do we fall of this vision? And, um, and creating some sort of direction. And I appreciated that you said that we're, we're going to have to have ceremonies to honor our pain. And um, having a, a ceremony in, in remembrance of the Holocaust and of the Nakba. And I found myself wondering, who do you think will be leading us in these ceremonies? Because again, it's not this intellectual discourse. We need to sit with other states. We need to sit with pain. And as I, as I was posing to myself the question, I, I wondered if women, what role women will play in holding this space with power and grace to move through the pain and not into rage and into violence. And I'd like to ask your opinion on, on who, what leadership um, do you trust to take us into those spaces? Like, who do you imagine leading us in that way? Um, well, well, just speaking personally, um, I... Um... You know, I, like many uh, diaspora Jews, uh, grew up reading no Palestinian writing, was exposed to no Palestinian literature, to no Palestinian film, nothing. And, 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 and yet I thought of myself as pretty well versed on these subjects. And I would say that, just speaking for me, um, it's really the engagement with Palestinian writing and thinking that has been um, deeply transformative um, at, at a number of levels. And for me, and part of me, what's so powerful and, and, and the reason that I have hope that, um, and I think there are other Jews, particularly younger uh, Jews who are going through the same experience is that, um, is that although the Palestinian and Jewish experiences are in some ways wildly different, um, we are actually, I think, as Jews, a people who, who when confront when if we're willing to actually look the Nakba in the face and look at the at the experience of dispossession and exile squarely, we cannot help but feel like we're looking in a mirror. Um, oh, because thank you that, for saying it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's funny you mentioned women. If you look at um, just a few weeks ago, was the Jewish was Tisha B'Av, the day on which Jews remember the destruction of the temples and the exiles on which those created. If you, in the in the in the poetry of Tisha B'Av. Jerusalem is often envisaged as a mourning woman, right? In part because I think mourning was something that women were allowed to do when they were prevented from so many other roles in society. And so again, I, I almost, you know, when I read and I'm tra sadly, I cannot read someone like Mahmoud Darwish in Arabic, so I can't fully appreciate him. But when I read him writing about what exile is like for him, I can't help thinking about our own literature and thinking that there, there is a possibility of, uh, of a way of moving beyond what I think is right now the kind of, the often very dismissive and kind of brutally dismissive kind of conversation that exists in the Jewish community about really grappling with what Palestinians have endured. And uh, in terms of creating shared spaces, um, do you have any, uh, like reference to Native American talking circles or circles of uh, healing or consultation. And um, because I know that you've explored different uh, references with South Africa, with Ireland, with Belgium, in terms of relating it to, yeah. to uh, restructuring, uh, let's say, political organization of this land. Yeah. Um, so in that process, before we can envision government, do you see value in, in those kind of shared spaces and I processes? 
Tremendous value. I don't think that I have gotten to the point yet, and I need to look to others uh, who may have done more work on this to really quite imagining what that would look like. But I think that um, one of the things that comes through really crucially, if, if one looks at other societies where there has been a reckoning with historical justice, and look, frankly, in the United States, when it comes to Native Americans, there has been very little. Um, we are having some conversation in the United States now, I think, uh, about reparations for African for, for slavery and Jim Crow. And I think one of the things that I think is most powerful to me about that conversation and comes through in South Africa too, is the constant emphasis if, um, by people like Tan Nasi Coates in the United States and Desmond Tutu and others that part of the reason to face the past is, to, is because if you don't, it's very likely to reoccur. Um, and so I think that's one of the, the kind of crucial things. As I said, just in passing in my Yav essay, uh, I really, um, I think that there is arguably a kind of small scale Nakba that is happening all the time, um, but I worry um, about a large scale one. Um, and although the reaction from many Jewish readers I've noticed has been that that is absurd, you know, I think that, that this is in the historical DNA of, of Israel. Um, it happened in 1947 and 1948. And I, I really worry that if it's not faced, that it could happen again. Okay, thank you, Diana. Uh, Jordan, would you like to uh, weigh in at this point and your reactions to? Abs absolutely, can you hear me okay? Wonderful, yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be joining all of you today uh, and to have this opportunity. Um, as, as Raja mentioned, I'm the Vice Chair at JSpace Canada and um, we're co-hosting this event. And uh, you know, we identify as a Jewish and a progressive Zionist organization. And I, I think a lot can be said about what that identity entails. I think Karen did a decent job of explaining some of it, but I'll start by saying that a lot of what progressive Zionism is today is based around Peter Beinart's thinking. Um, uh, I'll say that Peter is someone who I deeply admire and deeply respect. Uh, particularly when it comes to discussions uh, about Israel among Jews in the diaspora. Uh, so his book, The Crisis of Zionism, is considered by many, myself included, to be sort of the rule book uh, on how to be a progressive Zionist. And I, I know when it came out in, uh, I believe it was 2012, it was considered quite controversial within the Jewish community. Um, I, I know that uh, when I went to my alma mater, uh, McGill University. Uh, it was right after Peter just spoke and it was very, very controversial. I coincidentally was president of Israel on campus, which was the Central Zionist Club, uh, right after um, that happened. So um, some very interesting uh, uh, maturity uh, processes that, that have gone on since. Um, but, you know, it was very controversial at the time. I think its contents today are more or less accepted by many within our community. Um, and I think what this says is that Peter has the unique ability to challenge um, our community and have us confront ideas about Israel. Um, it's what the crisis of Zionism did in 2012, and it's what his article uh, in Jewish Currents does uh, today. And while, um, spoiler alert, I don't necessarily agree with his thesis, um, I think it's on folks who identify as Zionists, and, and in particular progressive Zionists, to let his words challenge us. So if you don't like the idea of a binational state or a confederation in Israel-Palestine, then what are you doing to change the status quo? How are you taking action against the occupation? What are you doing to bring Jews and Palestinians together and demand equality for all in the region? Um, I, I could say that polling, you know, indicates the two-state solution is, is still the most, most preferred option. Uh, there's a plurality of support among the ground, uh, according to some polls among Israelis and Palestinians. I could say that a confederation isn't feasible when there's competing nationalisms, but I think the reality remains that if nothing changes, we are headed for a one-state reality, one that is far less peaceful and utopic than the vision that Peter laid out for us. So I, I think if anything, uh, you know, if you don't support that, if you don't support um, where the trajectory is going, then what are you going to do about it? So um, while I don't necessarily agree with, uh, you know, Peter's conclusion, I think it's really, really important that we let it challenge us and that we listen to it and that we actually come up with answers and solutions. Um, I've heard some folks, uh, you know, in, in conversations in passing, completely dismiss this article. Um, and coincidentally, they're the same folks that I recently just got to read The Crisis of Zionism and started buying into your argument, Peter. So thanks for doing that. Uh, just joking. 
But I, I think it's really, really important uh, when folks, uh, particularly in the Jewish community and, and individuals who identify as Zionists, you know, completely dismiss uh, what's being brought forth, um, that like what Peter says in his article, um, these are not new ideas. These are ideas that were, you know, uh, forwarded by early Zionist thinkers and of course uh, by Palestinians for years. Um, and, you know, it, it might be very uncomfortable for us to sit with that, but we really should if we're not comfortable with the status quo. So I know this is less of a question, but, uh, you know, more of a, more of a comment, but I do appreciate um, your participation in the discourse, Peter, and I do think uh, what you're doing is valuable. And I know uh, members of our community will continue to deem you as a pariah, but I think this is critically important, particularly within circles uh, among folks like myself who identify as Zionists. So uh, thanks for being here and, and thanks Donna and thanks Raja and everyone. And maybe hey, curious you will agree with them. Maybe. Peter, anything to say in response to that? Um, well, first of all, I just want to say I, I, I appreciate it um, very much. Um, and I, I, um, I, I, I understand um, intellectually um, that there are, um, there are serious, thoughtful responses to my, uh, to my argument. And I also understand that emotionally, um, there is something uh, kind of wrenching about giving up Jewish statehood for many, many Jews because it is essentially giving up some degree of power. Um, and, and many Jews will, uh, even for Jews who consider themselves quite progressive, will look at Jewish history, including fairly recent Jewish history, and say, sorry, uh, we can't take that chance. Um, and um, and, I, and I, I, even though I've moved on from that view, I, I still feel the power of that. Um, and I guess I would say to those folks um, who still um, are wedded to the idea of a Jewish state alongside a Palestinian state, um, prove me wrong. You know, prove, prove that the two-state solution is, is not dead. You know, um, uh, I think, and, and, and if your answer is that we're going to create a, a Palestinian state by asking the Netanyahu government nicely to create one, um, uh, or maybe doing another study of Palestinian textbooks, I don't think you're likely to succeed. Um, if you really want to create a Palestinian state, you have to be willing to go out of your comfort zone and impose pressure on the Israeli government. Because we've had 11 years of this government clearly showing that, that if given, if, if allowed to do what it wants, it will simply further and further trench Israeli control. Um, so I guess that's the challenge I would hurl back to those people who are not convinced by my argument. Jerry, you're here. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me on this panel. It's quite uh, interesting. And thank you, Peter, for um, your intervention and your essay. I'm, uh, uh, perhaps it'll be viewed uh, in time as a turning point in mainstream American Jewish uh, discourse and Palestine, on Palestine and Israel. And hopefully it'll be the same in Canada. And I will share some with you later on about Canada's atmosphere around this discourse in a second. But um, I, I, do I, I did find your essay powerful. Um, I did uh, believe that you have come to the right conclusion um, uh, for the right purpose. And, but as you may appreciate, and you probably heard this before, and as mentioned earlier, yes, Palestinians and many academics and intellectuals have been saying the exact same thing for, for the past 30 plus years. Um, but the question about around that one, uh, Peter and others is that, and I know you appreciate this because you've, you've mentioned you've read Edward Said and others at, at that time period, uh, in the 80s, for example, Edward Said, Ibrahim Abu Lughod, Nasir Arudi, et cetera, who, who you, who would, and today we have a new cadre of, of writers and thinkers, uh, and gladly, and they're all mostly led by women, Noura Arakat, uh, Dan, um, Dina Bubutu, and, and, and others. And, and I think the exact, the importance of saying that point is not because who said what first, it's who said what and the consequence around saying it. And that's an important distinction in our discussion as we move forward on this. Because when they said it, and when we say it today, and I, growing up in North America, um, the atmosphere around us, uh, Edward Said was a lone voice against this, this, this world of pro-Israel, pro-Zionist pro perspectives, of the narration was all around uh, exclusion of Palestinian voices, exclusion of Palestinian thinking, Palestinians are not humans, they've been dehumanized. So there's no sense of polity, ethos, spirit, ideas around Palestinians and what it may mean. And that's why I think it's important to bring out this point. Um, and while it is a political solution, there's a moral case here. 
The Morrill case starts off, as, as mentioned earlier, is from 1948 for the Nakba. For Palestinians, that's a very important point in their history. And so as we talk about the futures um, I, uh, and about equality and justice and, and coexistence, and no one disputes that in terms of who's serious about this, uh, of, of moving this forward. And I'm not wedded to a one state or binational, I don't know, uh, but surely we all agree the two state is, is, is dead and has been dead uh, for many, many reasons. And it was dead probably at, at the signing of Oslo officially and maybe before that. Uh, I just, from a Palestinian perspective, it, Israel's actions, oppression and occupation, they view Zionism and the idea of Israel differently from say Jews would view Zionism in Israel. And I know you point that out in your essay and that's a very important intellectual framing. Um, um, and so it does not mean that Jewish self-determination cannot exist in coexistence with Palestinian self-determination, but one cannot dominate the other and one cannot be privileged over the other. And that's why as we talk about the futures, the architecture around how we frame moving forward, whatever form it is, whatever polity we decide, whatever state it becomes, it cannot be based on the old thinking of a, a Zionist state and a Zionist notion. And that's a very important, and that's, I'm sure there'll be disagreement around this one from, from others, but for Palestinians it's important because they view that perspective differently. The reality on the ground uh, for Palestinians today in the occupied terrors is a one state reality. So, when we talk, so the classic two-state solution from a Palestinian perspective is not about a two states. It's about two states that encompasses all of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, all of Gaza, uh, withdrawal from the Golan Heights, and there's you have your classic two-state solution. But for history, historical reasons, for asymmetrical reasons, for power dynamics, that could not happen. And and and. Uh, I, I blame Israel as much as I can blame the Palestinian leadership. And there's a strong critique of that leadership around their intellectual thinking because the biggest critics of the leadership, uh, especially today under the Palestinian Authority, are the Palestinian people. Okay. Uh, because the Oslo framework created the, the authority framework. And that is not a solution for Palestinians. So I think uh, for North Americans, we need to have a very honest discussion around this. And so, um, and so yes, for Jewish life in Israel, and the, the, the manifestation from the Holocaust onwards, that is, the, that is the, uh, an issue, a question of, of European Jewry being destroyed and, and, gen, and the genocide around the European Jewry, but the Palestinians had no, had no role in the Holocaust. So as we talk about the Nekba, we're not comparing Nekba to the Holocaust. We're, we're, we're trying to discuss the impact of a catastrophe for both peoples from a different perspective. So I think that's why I hope your essay challenges not just mainstream American Jewish thought, but the panelists you go on television with and, and, fellow, and, fellow, and fellow writers, because Palestinians don't have the same access. And, and, uh, and I'll get to the Canadian theater later on. Thanks, Jerry. And Bob, you're certainly not the least. We lift, we, we've kept the most uh, senior contributor on the panel to reflect on everything he's heard mm. so far. <laughs> so please go ahead, Bob. Maybe the oldest, certainly not the most senior. But uh, first of all, I, I want to thank Peter for his essay, as Jordan and others have, but for a slightly different reason. Uh, I am absolutely wedded to a two-state solution, as is Peace Now in Israel, Canadian Peace, Friends of Peace Now in Canada. And uh, it would be very hard to shake me of that, even though I pay close attention to arguments against it. Uh, and one thing that I really liked in Peter's essay was that when I finished reading it, I said, he's laid it out, it's quite correct. We got two choices, two equal states that function or apartheid. There's, there's nothing else possible. And apartheid is uh, absolute anathema to me and I think to most Jews, not just progressive Jews. And he's laid it out very clearly that if we cannot give Palestinian, I don't mean give, if we can Palestinians to create a viable state within secure borders, then we're an apartheid state and there's no in between. And so this led me to say, hey, two states is absolutely the only option because there's no chance of creating the type of one straight state solution that Peter envisions, which would not be horrible, but it's just not gonna happen. There's no chance 
that we're going to have a parliament with uh, Hamas in the, as leader of the opposition or the opposition party. There's no chance that we're going to be able to persuade the crazy settlers that they should just give up on their goal of uh, greater Israel. And there's also no chance that, um, that we can move uh, Hezbollah to the north away from their view that the Jews shouldn't be in the Middle East. And uh, the only possible solution, I think, short of another war, which one party or the other loses, which is also just about as bad as apartheid, the only possible solution are two co-equal states that can live in peace with each other. Uh, I just want to underline one tiny thing that Peter mentioned about a medical school in the West Bank and note that it's even worse than that. The medical school he's talking about is in Ariel. Ariel was the settlement that broke the peace talks. Uh, Omer would not give in on it. And uh, because of that, we had an, instead of peace talks, another intifada. And so it's absolutely critical that uh, Jews here pressure Jews in Israel to stop this nonsense of creating a new fact on the ground every time they turn around. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you all. And it's time to bring in uh, questions from our participants. Um, I will be naming the people who are asking the questions unless they tell me, ask me not to. If you don't want to be named, start your question with anonymous, please, and then I will not use your name. I already have a number of questions that have uh, come in. I'll take the first one from Jeff Wilkinson, who actually uh, wrote uh, a thoughtful uh, response to your essay in the Canadian Jewish uh, Record. His question is, your article and the many subsequent discussions have created a space for Jewish progressives to look at Israel in its entirety, including that the liberation of Jews has come at the expense of another. What do you think needs to happen in the diaspora to have this conversation turn into a new political movement where Jewish progressives are able to work outside of historical trauma and fear of losing Israel, working together with Palestinians, addressing the wrongs of 1948 and the inequities that continue today. And we've touched on this already a little bit, but uh, uh, go ahead, Peter. Um, thank you, and, and, and thank you, Jeffrey, for that. And I, I, you know, I wanna particularly thank Jeffrey and anyone else who's listening to this who, who utterly disagreed with, with what I wrote. I, I'm always really honored when people who strongly disagree with me are willing to listen anyway, um, which is something I think happens far too rarely, certainly in, in, in my home country of the United States. And it says in, I, it says in Pirkei Avot in the Mishnah, who is wise, the one who learns from all people. So I'm really grateful to, to those who are willing to listen, to learn from those they disagree with. Um, in terms of creating such a movement, I would just say, I think honestly it begins, um, with a kind of, uh, I think, a kind of perestroika, kind of glasnost and perestroika in Jewish spaces, which is to say, um, there is this dynamic by which Jews talk incessantly about Palestinians, uh, but not with Palestinians and not listening to Palestinians. It is still, again, I can only speak about the United States, but it is extremely rare in the United States for a synagogue, a Jewish community center, a Jewish day school, um, a Jewish youth group to have a Palestinian speaker or to assign a Palestinian author. Um, and I don't think that oftentimes people quite recognize it, but that process of constantly talking about people without listening to them is a process of, of not only ignorance, but of dehumanization. Um, and, um, and, and, and it produces a set of assumptions which are simply taken for granted, which uh, as I think is Jareer rightly pointed, don't reckon with Palestinian humanity. And once you are forced to reckon with Palestinian humanity, I think a great deal begins to change. Um, even for people who are very fearful, even for people who have, you know, have, you know, one uh, who are very fearful because of Jewish history, because of the trauma of the Holocaust, all of these kind of things. I think it's just worth noting that although some of the most right-wing voices in the Jewish community are people who have families of deep Holocaust trauma, some of the most passionate devotees of Palestinian rights 
uh, in both Israel and the United States in the Jewish community are also people whose families were deeply scarred by the Holocaust. If you read the writing of someone like Amira Haas or Sarah Roy, both of whom spent years living in Gaza, you, or Norman Finkelstein or many others, you see the way in which even for people who were personally deeply traumatized by the Holocaust, the experience of Palestinian humanity can take that experience and flip it on its head. So it becomes a parable not of we cannot afford to care about you, but a parable of we must care about you in order to honor our own history. Professor, may I add something here? Sure. Yes, uh, Peter, exactly. This is the point. I mean, there and, and other writers, Felicia Langer, uh, Israel Shahak, uh, Jeff Halper, others who've who've contributed to the thinking. But I also, I do, I do think it's important for North American theater too to, to recognize there are progressive Jews in North America, such as independent Jewish voices in Canada, if it not now, or Jewish voice, Jewish voices for peace in in the U.S. They've really taken to the next line. And in terms of this is why we, I feel more at home with talking to, with them and working with them uh, than with my fellow, uh, some, some fellow compared to Arabs and Palestinians. I think that progressive thinking uh, has really challenged the Jewish community, but also has challenged the Palestinian community on many fronts. And so um, that is a very important distinction too. And, and, and um, we can't forget that. And I think maybe the challenge for a lot of us is to not exclude other voices, not to, not to reduce our thinking as if we're all homogeneous. And I think that's an important uh, discussion for North America. So I, in my view, in Toronto, for example, the independent Jewish voices have really contributed a lot to the thinking around all this. I have Gabriella Gallagher here saying, it is unlikely that Israeli Jews will ever agree to become a minority in their own country. How does Peter or the other panelists uh, uh, respond? Is, is it possible to overcome this sort of thing that is at the heart of historical you know, Zionism? A, a Jewish majority country. Uh, is, is it, do you think, possible to overcome that? Well, I guess it's, you know, it's worth, we need to, we should start by recognizing, and I think some of the other panelists mentioned this, that um, there is one country now, right, which, which is roughly 50% Palestinian and 50% Jewish, uh, and, and quite possibly may become more than 50% Palestinian in the years to come. So, the, the, I think it's, it's worth reformulating the question. It's not really about whether Jews are willing to live in a country which is 50% or 50% plus Palestinian. It's whether Jews are willing to live in a country in which those Palestinians enjoy the right to be represented in their government. And part of what I try to argue in my, in my piece is that if you accept that there is a binational reality now, then you can reframe the question about binationalism from being, is binationalism difficult? The answer is yes. But you could, the question becomes, which form of binationalism is more difficult? One in which everyone has a voice in government or one in which one side is largely uh, 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 disenfranchised? And my argument is that actually the comparative data we have from political science suggests that binational states are most violent and most unstable when one side is disenfranchised. So again, I don't think that, um, the, the, I think the Jewish community is, a far, is far away from coming to, um, to, to, to some of these reckonings. But I do think it's important to remember to go to, to Dana's point you know, about the way in which we need to imagine things that literally, if you looked in South Africa or Northern Ireland, as only 10 years before the Good Friday Agreement in 1988 or 10 years before the first free election in South Africa in 1994, there were many who would have thought, most people who would have thought it was pretty much inconceivable. So one of the things about history is that history movements, mass movements make the impossible possible. In the United States, for most of the first half of the 20th century, as late as the 1940s, it would have been very difficult to, for many white Americans to imagine white soldiers serving under black officers in the United States military. And yet a mass movement made the unthinkable thinkable. And so I think, I believe that that's possible again. Bob would like to uh, jump in. Uh, go ahead, Bob. I, I have a few major concerns with the idea of uh, peaceful coexist coexistence in an equal, by national state. And the first one is this uh, 
enormous difference between what would happen in Israel and what has happened in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, you have England and Ireland representing the two factions. And the two factions are uh, able to draw on that support. Also in Northern Ireland, uh, everybody is a Christian. Almost everybody is white. I shouldn't say everybody, but it is a Christian country in which people are Anglo-Saxon and the barriers are not uh, nearly as important as uh, the difference between whether you like the Pope or you don't like the Pope. Now, in the Middle East, what you have is one Jewish state and a surrounding group of Arab states with a very small Christian population. Uh, there is nobody equivalent to Britain or Ireland who's going to have the Jews back. There's no state in the Middle East that has ever, uh, that, that, that the Jews will ever have confidence in saying, I know these guys will defend us. If there's another intifada, they'll be there to, to help suppress it. It's just not going to happen. And so you've got a tremendously different dynamic. Uh, in Israel, you have a lot of people who have come from Arab countries, who have immigrated from Yemen, from Saudi Arabia, from Syria, from, from all over in the non-Arab countries such as Iraq, I sorry, such as Iran. And these people are very, very suspicious of the idea of giving up their sovereignty in any way, shape or form. So again, I come back, I think you had a great argument when you said it's either this or apartheid, but the only answer I can give is, well, we don't want either. So we've got to make two states work. Donna, go ahead. Thank you. Um... Bob, I just wanted to, to respond to that also a little bit and challenge saying that, you know, Jews lived in the Middle East forever and it, there was peaceful coexistence forever. There, this um, equation in Peter's essay of Palestinians to Nazi supporters is quite, uh, was quite jarring to me because it's not like we, we wake up with this rage to hate Jews. No, these are resistance movements that are born out of the struggle for the people to hold on to what they have left, which is just the land. Fa, um, I think that as soon as peace is on the table, and Peter, you mentioned it in your essay, nobody wants to wake up and go to war. And I think you'd find many Palestinians, and you also mentioned Hamas, and you also mentioned Hezbollah earlier, and I think that once, um, you know, I, I'd also like to, to tie in maybe a, a, a another story, but once I think we feel that Israel is, is there as a participant within the region and not as this kind of barbar, which is a term we use in Arabic, which is like a boogeyman, you know, who's there, who's uh, kind of aggressively holding the region up hostage, Ever, uh, so many tensions will die down. And, and I wanted to respond a bit to Jeff Wilkinson's question actually about like, what does it take within the diaspora? Because we need meeting grounds, as you said, Peter, we need a, a meeting place and opportunities for to hear, to have conversations with and not conversations about. And I remembered as you were speaking, this experience that I had at a, a festival in Portugal, 2012, I went and again in 2014. 2012, I went and I was wearing a kofia and I remember I, I went to this festival alone and somebody walked up to me and was speaking in Hebrew. And I said, I don't speak Hebrew. And he goes, what do you mean? Where are you from? And I said, I'm from Palestine. And he said, what? I said, Palestine. He said, what? I said, Palestine. He goes, oh, I've never heard of it. I can't tell you the adrenaline that shot through my body and the feeling of rage that even that we're not, we're in neutral ground. We're in this festival, which is this, you know, temporary autonomous zone. We break all the rules and we can't break this rule. Like this is how you greet me. And in, in um, yeah, in, in 2014, there was also a, a different experience. Then there was the uh, a raid in Gaza. I was at the same festival and it was a totally different experience. I, I sat down next to someone in a tent and 
were just looking out over the music and discover that he's from Israel and my news feed is all, you know, either bombings in Gaza or the, the World Cup. And I asked him, he said, you are part of the only democracy in the Middle East. You know, what are you doing here? He said, I left. I left. I took my kid. I don't want him to serve in the IDF. I'm done with that. I said, but if you can't vote and you can't raise that voice and you can't make a change, then what hope does anyone have? And he said, oh, I'm no one's martyr. You know, I, I just want to go back to Europe and, and raise my kid. And, and again, the pain and the sadness and the rage. So, so these neutral spaces are, are very important and trust that, you know, everyone wants peace on, on either side. I think that, at, that if there is a way, it, we can achieve it, you know? Okay, thanks, uh, Thanks, Dana. Um, Cindy Abelson here asking about the history between Jews and Palestinians is, is not a good one. And there's a lot of terror being incurred by both sides at each other. Uh, and and I mean, she, her question is, how do we overcome the fear that stems out of such history um, before we can actually build trust that this is not the future? Is that for me? Or <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. uh, um, um, I, I don't think I can, I can't lay out a program. Um, but I can, there are people who inspire me, um, uh, who I think have, have kind of walked these journeys. You know, um, one of the uh, people I mentioned just in passing in my essay is uh, Menachem Froman, who was the rabbi of the settlement of Tekoa, which is a quite radical settlement. And um, Froman kind of went on a journey uh, in which he did something that far few settlers do. He actually genuinely got to know the Palestinians living as his neighbors. And, and once he did, he had the courage and the imagination to recognize that, um, um, that, uh, that he's, his entire perspective needed to change radically. Um, and when he, you know, when he died, um, there was a kind of a nine hour multi-faith celebration and he had come to the belief that um, the land needed to be shared and all people needed to live equally. And um, I, I think that um, sometimes um, Palestinians, in my experience, don't understand why um, uh, Jews could be so afraid, given that uh, Israel is such a massive, powerful state, and given that in every interaction between these two sides, it's Palestinians who suffer so much more dramatically. Um, and I think that um, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Jews, um, even if they understand intellectually what Donna was saying about how Palestinians, like all human beings, simply want a, basic, a decent life in which they can raise their kids and pursue, and pursue their goals and, and have no more desire to kill or be killed than any other human being, even if people understand that intellectually, the Jewish conversation is so saturated with these images, the image of the suicide bomber, the image of, of the Hamas fighter, the, 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 the kind of the myth of the Palestinian textbook. Um, all of these things are so omnipresent that I think they kind of, they suffocate our ability to actually recognize those core realities. And th there needs to be a a kind of process in which those things are resuscitated. Um, and, 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 and yet, I think, unfortunately, um, there are too few opportunities to do that. I can remember a question. I may just quickly uh, add in something. Roger. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Lovely. No, um, uh, on that, and, and I appreciate Peter's answer, um, I, I think also in the diaspora, it's really important that we, we engage with, um, I mean, particularly the Jewish diaspora and the Arab and Palestinian di diaspora engage with, um, with, you know, real interactions. Um, because like what Peter and, and um, what Tana said, um, the narrative of the other is, is, is very much pervasive. Um, I, I don't want to say just in the Jewish community. I think it also probably exists in the Arab and the Palestinian community as well. I know from personal conversations on campus, um, I particularly, as a Jewish and a Zionist student, I went on campus ready to fight, uh, ready to you know defend Israel. I think Peter wrote 
I don't want to keep going back to the crisis of Zionism, but uh, too often um, members of the Jewish community are, are trained almost to uh, reflexively defend Israel without learning about you know, learning about it as a country that's flawed and complex and can do that can do wrong, right? Um, and you know that's a, a beautiful thing to learn, but it's also really difficult to unlearn. Um, but you know I'm also cognizant of the fact that like you know Jews, as with Palestinians, um, belong to intersecting in multiple identities. So my experience, and I know. I don't believe anyone on this panel, you know, is a, a Jewish of North African um, or Middle Eastern descent. Um, so, like, I think it's really important that when we talk about narratives about Jews uh, in North Africa, in the Middle East, um, life being completely peaceful before the state of Israel was created, I think we also need to, you know, debunk that the same way that Jews need to, you know, counter um, uh, our ideas that the Nakba didn't exist or that there wasn't dispossession at the hands of, um, uh, of the Haganah. Um, because if you talk to Jews in North Africa and the Middle East, you know, there's stories of Mela's in Morocco, of, of the Farhoun in Iraq. These are real experiences that weren't perfect in, you know, uh, in many cases in the 1940s. Uh, what happened around the same time as the Nakba was, um, uh, in many cases, an ethnic cleansing or mass movement of Jews uh, into Israel that was very problematic. Um, and so it's really important that we counter these things. Uh, I think it's really important within the Jewish community we do it. Uh, because when I certainly, for the first time, met a Palestinian in real life and had a conversation, um, it was really difficult for me to be like to be to to encounter a lot of these conversations that I thought I had these talking points that I learned off of a phone um, or you know in a pamphlet that you know a family member sent to me saying this is how you defend Israel on campus. It's not that simple, uh, and it would be much better if in our education system um, that we taught that you know these places and these narratives that we learn aren't perfect. Um, that's the thing I would add, because I think it's really important in the diaspora, not just on the ground in Israel and Palestine, but in the diaspora that we talk about these things and we kind of deconstruct these narratives uh, about right and wrong. Absolutely. Um, there are a number of questions here that are more about the mechanics of a one state legal system, who has access to what, and I don't think that's our conversation so much today as it should be towards the vision that you propose, Peter. You're proposing a vision, you're not proposing a, an entire solution with a, an implementation plan. Um, and, and I think at the core of that vision is really a, a revision of Zionism. Uh, I read that you still consider yourself a Zionist. Um, so and, and you're, you're, you've come up with Zionism 2.0 of some sorts that says, instead of a Jewish state, uh, a, a home for the Jews, uh, a, a state that provides a home for the Jews. Is, is this a proper characterization? In, in, in yes, and, and, and look, I, I'm not expecting uh, Palestinians um, uh, to all of a sudden, I'm not expecting, I'm gonna convince Palestinians to all of a sudden find Zionism um, to be a, a word that they're gonna embrace uh, or feel comfortable with. But, what I was, um, what I was, the, what I, the, what I tried to argue in my piece is that if one look, goes back historically to figures like Ahad Ha'am, for instance, uh, uh, um, uh, and even early in the 20th century, even some who later came to support a Jewish state, like 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 Zev Jabotinsky and Leon Pinsker and others, um, you see a call for a kind of a, an autonomous Jewish um, uh, cultural expression, and the reason that I embrace that tradition. If tradition had uh, was also embraced by binationalists like Martin Buber and Hannah Arendt and Gershom Scholem and, uh, and others, Judah Magnus, who who called themselves Zionists but believed in a binational state, is I believe there is something precious about a vibrant Jewish society in Israel Palestine. This is what Akar Ha'am was interested in. You can see it in the in the re, in the revival of Hebrew as a living language. Uh, Khan Ha'am believed that if there was a vibrant Jewish society, of course there were Jews um, before Zionism um, in, in Jerusalem, in Spot, but there was not, I think, the kind of, of, of vibrant Jewish society that later emerged. And that Jewish society, I think, has been extremely important for Jews around the world. Its cultural production has been very important for Jews around the world, even religiously. There are things that are possible um, when you have a, a, a large Jewish community in the land of Israel. So that's the Zionism. That's why I call myself a Zionist, because I'm not a diasporist. I believe there is something special about a thriving Jewish society 
in the land in Israel, Palestine, what Jews call Eretz Israel. And yet, I believe that you can have a community that has the cultural autonomy to have to, to, to run its affairs in Hebrew, for instance, to celebrate Jewish holidays, that is within a framework of equality and also that allows for historical justice. I don't see those two things as mutually exclusive. I see them as it's a difficult process, no question about it, but I don't believe that they're mutually exclusive. And, and if I may add, the, the, and I appreciate that, Peter, I, I really do, in terms of that aspect, and I think these, in your, one of your lines in your essay, you talked about you crossed the red line. And so hopefully your next phase, I want you to cross another red line, mm-hmm. and, and, and <laughs> if you may. Uh, but. You're right. I mean, I think many Palestinians will have a hard time talking about Zionism in terms of the, the, the how it impacts Jews versus how it impacts them. Um, because early Zionists, yes, some early Zionists did not did recognize there were indigenous people living in Palestine. But let's be frank, they didn't really care about them at the same time. They, they still pursued a colonial project, an enterprise, as a fulfillment of, of, of Jewish self-determination. Um, and, and I think... Uh, I appreciate that, but at the same time, that's a consequence that I think, to, to, to Jordan's point and perhaps a bit of Bob's point, that that yes, Palestinians, um, um, unlike their Arab brethren, have a direct relationship between between Palestinians and, and Zionism, uh, in that sense. And and yes, maybe Palestinians and broader Arab community do not fully appreciate Jewish life in the Arab world prior to forty eight. Um, it's a mixed life, and I, I but I, I fully recognize your point, but. But it's not a ledger that where we have to, in order to, to, to rectify Palestinian injustice, therefore we have to rectify Jewish injustice uh, in the Arab world. I think it's more complicated than that. And I think it's important to, to not to reduce the conflict as one of religion. Uh, and, and I think I don't agree with Bob's point about, you know, language of Hamas and Muslims and minority Christians and surrounded Arabs. That, that is not the portrayal. And that and so unfortunately goes back to the misportrayal and misrepresentation of, of Palestinian uh, of life and society and perspectives. And so it is not one of religion. Uh, yes, there are Palestinian Christians and Jews and, there, uh, and Muslims and there are Palestinian Jews. Uh, of course there are. But all of these Palestinians were victimized by the Nakba. They didn't distinguish between if you're a Christian or you're a Muslim. Um, whether you're in Haifa or Acre or wherever you were, in the 500 villages, a lot of the villages were destroyed. Many of them were Christians and, and, and Muslims. So it is, it is a political question for, for Palestinians and a restorative justice question for Palestinians. And that's why I think the only way to talk about the future is through a lens of decolonization. It is not a lens of just uh, of, of giving parity and, and recognizing each other and a mutual coexistence. It's got to be designed at a different level of future that cannot be designed from the past. Um, and I'll leave it at that. And there's more to say, but I'll leave it at that for now. Can I, can I pick up on that uh, trail of thought? Sure thing. Just I don't in, get in, terms, really well. in terms of the language, so we have the peace plan, we have deal of the century, we have extending sovereignty, we have all of this buzzword jargon that talks around and really masks imperialism and masks apartheid. And so I find that it's very difficult to approach a solution with the same language that create, like that frames the problem, let's say. So we kind of need a new language and we need a new vocabulary, even words like normalization, even words like Zionism, even words like Israel and Palestine. If we can get away from these um, descriptors for these old states of division, we can start to generate a new language that describes this new common space of shared possibility and shared potential. And I'd like to ask uh, Peter what he thinks of this kind of, um, this, the language, if you've, if, what you think of the language. Um, uh, I, I, I entirely agree. And I, I think that one of the questions that I think in terms of language that is, I think, inherent in your question, and also I think in, in Jarir's question is, um, what does Israeli Jewish identity look like um, without, um, uh, with, it, 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 if there is genuine equality, right? Um, I think that Israeli, uh, there is a, um, I think there's some very fundamental questions that have to be asked about what it is essentially to be an Israeli Jew if being an Israeli Jew does not mean having privileges that Palestinians do not. 
And I think that um, in some ways, I think that the most, I think the most creative set of politicians in this entire conflict right now, perhaps not surprisingly, are the leaders of the Palestinian citizen community in Israel. Because I think they are actually the people who, uh, they, they're Palestinians who also I think have the most intimate understanding and interaction with Israeli Jews. And I think the most creative thinking about what this society might look like, um, what Palestinian identity, but also what Jewish identity might look like to, to take uh, Jarir's uh, language in a kind of decolonized space, right? Which I think is important to say um, that a decolonized space does not mean a space that in which Jews go back to Poland or, or Morocco. It means a space, I think, uh, in which in which Jewish life and vibrant Jewish life is secured actually in a much more fundamental way because it doesn't actually have to live, exist at Palestinian expense. And I think that um, any society that was, uh, you know, we see even in our own society, the United States and Canada, how long and difficult and treacherous a road that is. But I think ultimately it's also a road that actually can be liberating for both peoples. And so that's the road that I hope we can walk, we can move down. Okay, Bob, you can just quickly, please, because I have a lot of questions to go to. Okay. Uh, I want to respond to Jerry and uh, Dana in the most respectful way. Um, I, I think it's important to look at the history of Jews in the Middle East before we say Jews lived peacefully in the Middle East up until the creation of Israel. That just ain't so. Um, Theodore Herzl's idea was that uh, there would be a Zionist state within the Ottoman Empire. And in fact, Herzl went to uh, what is now Turkey and enrolled in law school because he thought that uh, this way we can be the, I can be the representative of the Jews in Palestine. Then um, I know that there were right-wing Jews in the 1920s and 30s who made life difficult for the indigenous Palestinians. Uh, but Ben-Gurion wasn't one of them early on. Early on, Ben-Gurion's plan was that there would be a binational state. And what happened was one day he was coming home from a meeting and a gang beat him up and uh, beat him quite severely. And after that, he changed his mind and he said, we got to have two separate states. We can't live with it. The foundation of Israel, and I think this is really important, when Israel became a state, five nations declared war on Israel immediately and without, and I think that uh, anybody here will agree, without doing it for the people of Palestine. This was to get the Jews out of the Middle East. And uh, the poor Palestinians suffered terribly as a result of these wars. So to suggest that there is a history of- Bob, will be, this will be very long. There's a lot of detail on that. I'd like us to focus more- Point is just um, there is not a history of peaceful coexistence. Well, before yeah, before the Jewish immigration, uh, the, the mass Jewish immigration in the late eighties, early nineties, nineties, uh, there was peaceful coexistence for centuries. I'd like to move the conversation now to South Africa. A number of our participants, uh, the, the the comparison uh, uh, with South Africa, you know, was apt. Um, one particular one here, as a brown-skinned Canadian who was born in South Africa and lived under apartheid. Peter, can you share your insights on how, or if, a declared leader can arise among Jews in Israel? As you know, the cleric moved to, uh, to a peaceful one-state solution, not a fictional white homeland with blacks relegated to Bantustans, because he was realistic and saw where things would go if the status quo persisted. Thank you for your vision and intellectual honesty, Ziad says. Um, so I just want to quickly just say something about this question about, about coexistence uh, before Zionism. I, I think that, um, um, I think that as the, the other speakers said, the, you know, the history is complex. You're talking about many, many different societies over hundreds and hundreds of years. It's not all a monolithic experience. I think one of the challenges that um, exists in Jewish discourse is that the, is that for various political reasons, Mizrahi Jewish political leadership has essentially ended up telling a story um, that, that, that very negatively depicts 
Jewish life in the Arab world often. And I think we have to ask the question of why it was that Mizrahi Jews moved in that political direction. I, I would recommend to anyone who's interested in this, Rachel Shabi's book, We Look Like the Enemy, which actually I think tells a fascinating story in many ways of how Mizrahi Jews, in order to prove their Israeliness, had to essentially become anti-Arab, even though they were Arabs themselves. Anyway, I just couldn't resist. On South Africa, look, there are very important differences between Israel, Palestine, and South Africa. South Africa is not a binational society. There was a South Africa in this that existed, I and mean, you could see it as manifested in the ANC, which was a genuinely multiracial, multi-religious movement. It's the military leader of the ANC was a white Jewish man, Joe Slovak, right? So um, the conflict in certain ways has very fundamental differences, but, um, but I think it's what, is, what we can take from South Africa is, um, is the, uh, is, is, but is morally, is, is, is if we go back to looking at white, including white Jewish discourse in South Africa um, under apartheid, and I, I, as the child of South Africans, I, I saw much of it firsthand. I think we will be really struck by how similar some of it is to contemporary Jewish discourse, which is essentially to say the, 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 the notion when, when white South Africans talked about what a country, a, one equal country would look like, their discussion was mostly a completely apocalyptic, in which they really could not envision this as being a place in which they could live safely. And yet it's turned out that actually for all of post-apartheid South Africa's problems, it actually turned out that the, that the ANC had a vision that actually included white South Africans. Um, and ultimately, I think that although life has not been easy in post-apartheid South Africa, if white South Africans ask themselves the question, where would we be today if we had held on to apartheid for another 10 or 20 or 30 years, that most white South Africans would actually say that it's not just that black South Africans benefited from apartheid ending, but we benefited from apartheid ending. And my hope is that there will be a, a moment in a time where more Jews can ultimately start to make a similar move. Um, Shoki Fahel is asking about uh, a few weeks back, we did a webinar with Dr. Michael Dan uh, on his book, The Two-State Dilemma. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Peter. Uh, I'm not. So it, it, he comes at the conflict uh, with the uh, uh, game theory uh, approach to seeing you know, who comes ahead in what kind of situation. And um, he comes to the same solution as, as, as you even though he says this is not prescriptive, but it, it, using that game theory analysis framework arrives at a, a two state will give both peoples uh, uh, sort of the most in the sense that everybody will have access to all of the land. Um, a, a second, uh, the a second best would be a two state solution, which is might be easier to govern but will we'll deprive uh, the people of sort of both of their lands and uh, uh, access to all of, uh, all of the land. And, and Choco is asking, you know, if there's a, what, what parallels there are between his book and, and your essay. I think the approach is different, but you arrive at the same place. Uh, yeah, I actually have heard of the book. I just haven't had a chance to, to, yeah. to read it. Um, you know, um, there are people in, there are Israeli Jews and Palestinians who are talking about confederation, which in some ways is somewhere in between a one and two state, which is essentially would be two sovereign states, but that allowed, that had free movement between the two of them and shared some of their sovereignty. So for instance, um, uh, Palestinian refugees under this scenario, I think would, would be able to return to uh, what's now Israel proper, but would retain citizenship in a Palestinian state, whilst settlers could remain in the West Bank, of course, living as equals um, in, uh, in a, under a Palestinian state but remain citizens of Israel. I think there are big questions about that, but I do think it is valuable for people to stop, to at least start moving beyond the notion of building a high wall. Because I think that um, that, um, to me, that answer misunderstands so many important dynamics of what's actually at play. Yeah, because for people who are still clinging to the two states, when it's not possible anymore, and, and I'm not saying that it isn't, but there's certainly a, a lot of argument that it's not possible anymore. 
we need to start looking at all these different possible alternatives rather than just stick to something that may die very soon if it's not dead, uh, you know, uh, already. I have a question from Dr. Barbara Landau. How can we address the anti-normalization policy that impacts so many of us, Jews, who want a mutually respectful relationship and share many values that would be the basis of negotiations for a peaceful resolution? And that's to you, Peter. Um, so it's wonderful to hear from Barbara, who's a dear friend. I, I don't think I'm the person best uh, um, to equip to respond to that. I don't know if there are other panelists who want to, but again, since I don't, since I am not inside the Palestinian national movement, um, the debates about normalization for me are ones that I experience as an outsider. Um, and so I, I think probably if others want to join in on that, they're welcome to, but I'm probably not the best position. Uh, Jerry, Donna, would you like to? Uh, so this is an important question in terms of, uh, sorry, Dana, go ahead if you want. No, no, go ahead. Uh, this is an important question, I think, that I think the Palestinian national movement has, has transformed many phases over the past few years uh, on, on normalization. And I think the crux of why normalization or anti-normalization exists is, 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 is not because of the narrative from the Arab regimes. Remember, distinguished Arab authoritarian regimes between the people. And so the people in the Arab world, mainly the, the Levant area and Palestine, um, have a different perspective of what normalization means. And, and theirs is based on justice. And until there's justice and restored, in this case, occupation is removed, until we have this full-fledged uh, serious discussion about restorative justice, you can't have normalization. That is the root cause of the peoples. The regime's perspectives is more politics. They're authoritarian. They don't represent the wills of the people. So I'm not gonna. I don't defend. I don't talk about. I don't speak on their behalf, and I won't defend them. But it is important to talk about the people's perspectives on this. And so and this goes back to the point of, of of Palestinians in this case view Israel and Zionism from a lens of experience. It's not because there's antipathy towards Jews. There is. It doesn't mean that they won't drive Jews away. And that that kind of violent language does not exist in the Palestine, especially in today's current narrative. But the reality on the ground versus our reality in North America are two different things. I mean, I, I'm, I mean, I have a perspective, but I live in North America. I think the reality on the ground is different. You talk to residents in Hebron, residents in Nablus, residents in, 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 in Janine, their daily life is different. So to talk to them about normalization um, is, is, is not just simply uh, an intellectual endeavor, it's an experience level. And that's why that's part of the, that's part of the answer for that one. There's more to it than there, uh, but the, the hopeful part, there's a cadre of new leadership and voices and artists and thinkers that are challenging the normative perspectives of Palestinian national thought. But, in, but, it's, but what I do caution is that that perspective is more secular, that perspective is more challenging to what Israelis might think. So remember the PA and the PLO have lost a lot of the authority and respect uh, uh, over the past many years. It does not mean there's no hope for the PLO, but I think that the new cadre of thinkers have a different vision that is even more, more difficult uh, perhaps to appreciate for a lot of Israelis and Jews, but it's based on justice and international law. It's based on political rectification and based on morality and universality. So it's, it's, it's not exceptionalizing Palestine, it's rather bringing Palestine in the fold of an international perspective. So uh, that's something to be, to be thinking about. Okay, it is time for one last question and uh, a, as fast an answer as possible. Um, this comes to us from Henry L Lawton. Uh, my long-held ass long assumption is that only allies of Israel that have the incentive and belief to impose a two-state solution where there are equal franchises would bring about a two-state solution. Has that prospect receded because of changes in Israel where Palestinians are disenfranchised, or because of greater inequality and disenfranchisement and acceptance of inequality are happening within the allies of Israel, within their own borders that have sort of reduced their commitment to um, equality in Israel? Um, well, I, I think, you know, it's certainly true that the United States has not been willing to exercise really any leverage, put really any pressure on Israel. I mean, the last American president who really actually, in a tangible way, 
put pressure on Israel was George H.W. Bush in the early 1990s. No American president has been willing to do that since. That, that has a lot to do with American domestic politics. Um, and it also has to, do, it has to do with, I think, unfortunately, the kind of the control of the American Jewish community by um, a group of people who, who, who are supporting the Israeli government no matter what. It has to do with evangelical Christian influence. And I think it also has to do, with, as Jarir was talking about, about the fact that Palestinians don't have much of a voice in politics in the United States. Um, but I do think there are significant changes that we're seeing um, on the ground and, and uh, in the United States and, and around the, 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 in the West. And I think um, those are ones that I think, those shifts, those movements, I think give me a lot of hope. Um, and, um, and I think that we are in a moment, certainly in the United States, of mass movements that are changing conversations about a whole range of issues, whether it's climate or healthcare or, or racial justice. And I believe that such a movement could do that here as well. Um, and, um, and so it's a, it's a, that's what gives me hope the politics here will change so we can be a partner for justice on the ground rather than being a force opposer. Okay, you each get your 30 second closing statement. Uh, fire away, Bob. Well, I'm gonna repeat what I said before that I really think that Peter has laid out an excellent uh, dichotomy. It's either co-equal states or apartheid. And since I can't imagine how you're gonna get this by national state working, co-equal is absolutely essential. Jordan? Can you, can you hear and see me? I changed to my yeah. iPod. Yeah. Is my computer overheated? Um, no, I just want to thank everyone. Um, uh, particularly, it's been um, really important that we've had a, a Palestinian Arab presence in these conversations. And while we may not agree on everything, um, it's really important that we continue having these conversations. And thank you, Peter. Um, I'm going to have to get you to talk to some of my relatives about some of the things you're bringing up because <laughs> they won't listen to me. Um, but I'll, I'll no, work on them. Talk to mine. <laughs> Dana? Uh, maybe I just want to uh, tie this around to Barbara's question about anti-normalization and just say beyond normalization, I think we need to think about recognition of responsibility. We have to think about right of return. We have to think about representation, equal right to vote for all. We have to think about resolution and rebuilding. And, and then we get into the state where, um, where we can really flourish together. So I think beyond normalization, we really need to think about reconciliation. And, um, and I thank everyone for their presence today. I'm really grateful to be sharing this digital space and hopefully it's the beginning of more conversations to come. Jerry? Um, just, we can't, we can't continue to talk about Palestinians without Palestinians present, and that's one. But two, I wish we had more time about North American theater, because Peter, uh, I, I think that's the next level of, uh, of your engagement with Palestinian intellectuals in, in the United States and, and hope, uh, hopefully that journey. And I'm happy to help you and be part of your discussions moving forward in terms of that journey is important for the North American theater uh, 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 and it's for both North, Ameri North American Jews and Palestinians together. Um, yeah, Peter, your essay and Michael Dan's book um, help in a significant way for us to have these conversations uh, from the two communities and, and have productive ones. So you've, you've, done, a, you've done us a great of good with your thoughts. And uh, we are at the beginning. Uh, this has to continue. And, and, and inshallah, it will continue. Last word, Peter. Um, I just wanted to thank you all so much for giving me this opportunity. I think this, again, the people in this conversation uh, seems to me a, a kind of model of the conversation I wish we could make more. I was really impressed by the honesty of everyone on this uh, panel. Uh, no one was spreading propaganda. People were speaking from, from the heart. You could tell that. And that's it's in, it definitely uh, the only way to, to have you know, real uh, dialogue. So I thank you all very humbly. And I turn it back to Karen for closing remarks. Thank you so much. Um, I could tell from all of the questions, which by the way, we're going to save. 
that there were various levels of blood pressure going up and down because, of course, we didn't have a chance to really uh, drill down and, in, and engage. But we can't thank you enough, Peter. You always give us food for thought, uh, and uh, that's valued. Uh, we've got to continue these conversations and broaden our Palestinian uh, Jewish dialogue and recognition. And of, of course, our discussants, uh, Dana, Jerry, Bob, Jordan, uh, bravo. This is just the beginning um, of this kind of more public conversation, but we're certainly going to invite you to continue to go to more depth with us. Um, and of course, uh, the kind of collaboration, partnership that we have with organizations like Peace Now, Bob, and like the Arab Jewish Dialogue that actually Jerry uh, was a part of too. So we're welcoming you back to that, Jerry. We, it's wonderful to engage you. And uh, Jordan, I know that you're going to be helping to spearhead our uh, Palestinian Jewish, Arab Jewish dialogue program on campus across the country coming this fall because right now it's so polarized and people fighting with each other we're going to bring the people together uh, dana reconciliation is a concept that um canada knows about uh you know and we we do need to continue further in that way and of course, uh, we want to thank our volunteers, uh, Amira Hassan, who did our poster and helped with the promotion, and David Grosskind uh, from JSpace, who is our valued behind the scenes person who helps make all this happen. And you, our audience and supporters, thank you so much for joining us um, for another courageous conversation. You, you're going to get a brief survey soon, and you'll have a chance to give us more of your input so that we can continue to do this work. Join us uh, this Sunday, actually, for Judy Maltz from Haaretz, who's going to talk, to, give us a, a frontline experience of what's going on with the youth in the uh, protests in Israel right now. It's a young people story is what she's saying. And soon with Raja Khoury Conversations, we'll also host Peter Biro, who will have an interesting approach and important conversation about the importance of courageous citizenship to preserve democracy. Uh, in Canada, of course, but also worldwide. I would really be remiss if I didn't uh, ask you all to consider uh, supporting this kind of conversation, this kind of work, this kind of very important dialogue program. You'll get another button with the survey to make a donation. Whatever you can would be most appreciated and it will ensure that we can continue to do this with a charitable receipt over $25, of course. I had to get that in. You know I did. Um, on behalf of JSpace Canada, and if I may, on behalf of Raja Khoury Conversations, thank you, Raja, for everything you do. We all kind of put ourselves on the line with our own communities in this work when we truly believe in human rights, social justice, equity, and equality. Thank you again. Shalom. Salam. Bye-bye, all. Have a good evening. Good night.